Welcome. Ну что, поехали. It is amazing. Добро пожаловать. And I'd like to thank friends at YSI for, um, you know, putting it all together. And I'd like to thank the translators. So if you're a translator, I'd ask you to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I promise as a translator, to scream and yell and let Michael and Earl know when they talk too fast. Deal? All right. We're going to try our best. It's hard because it's exciting. But, um, I'm just going to drink a lot of water and talk slow. Good luck. We're here. We're here to highlight the upcoming teachings by Geshe Michael Road. <laughs> that was a that was a test. Uh, we're here to talk about Geshe's teachings. He's going to talk about the fourth chapter of the Yoga Sutra on August 22nd until uh, September 2nd. He did a video ad for it and it was a little depressing. He said, this is probably the last time I'll I got muted. Am I unmuted? I don't know where I left off. Did I, did you get the depressing part? I'll start again. I'm not sure what happened. Geshe Michael did an advertising for the event and it was a little sad. He said, this is probably the last time I'll teach it. Это последний раз, когда я обучаю этой четвертой главе. Последний раз, когда он обучал ей, это было 15 лет назад. И я думаю, что you know, one and two, maybe chapter three, which is Excuse me, I'm sorry, let me interrupt you. Yelena, Russian channel, please go to Russian channel. You are an English channel. Excuse me. It's okay. How are we doing now? Are we good? Thank you, tech team. So. Thank you. It, in many ways, it's a very rare opportunity uh, to receive teachings on the fourth chapter. And I'm very happy today to get to talk about this with Michael, who I somewhat recently reconnected with after many years of uh, disconnect. And it's been super fun. Uh, we engage in incredibly profound discussions. Last night, it was about a cassowary bird. They're six feet tall, 200 pounds, and they're the deadliest bird in the world. Uh, we also talk comic books, and we talk life-threatening life circumstances and and then it always ends up at the Yoga Sutra, which he knows inside and out. And I also really appreciate his uh, sense of humor. 
I asked him for his bio, to which he replied, this is probably not gonna work, but here's my first draft. Once, I was the totality of all existence. And so was everyone and everything too. Everything was so beautiful just the way it was. 16 pages later, he said, I'm still a work in progress, just like everyone else who makes many mistakes despite best intentions. And uh, it was a publishable work of art. So I'd like to uh, like to thank Michael for joining us. And I'm trying to get him to lure him in to teach more and more with YSI. And he'll be teaching the Sanskrit part of the uh, Yoga Sutra event with Geshe Michael. So I'd like to start by asking Michael to just tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, you know, name, date of birth, social security number type stuff, uh, a bit about your life, and then the story of how you met the Yoga Sutra. Well, thank you for inviting me to this talk, and uh, thank you to everyone for, for being here and supporting this conversation. I'm Michael Johnson, and I've been a full-time yoga instructor for about 20 years, um, a teacher trainer since 2003, an advanced teacher trainer since 2007. And though I feel like I've learned a lot, I, the more I learn, the more I feel like I, I have yet to learn. So I'm excited to dive more deeply into this text. I came across the Yoga Sutra over 20 years ago and immediately decided that I wanted to memorize it. And then I found out that it was a thing. And I started to memorize the English first. It was a translation by Swami Satchidananda. And I compared his translation with another translation. I was like, wait a minute. These are very different. What if I memorize the wrong one? So eventually it occurred to me that I should learn the original language that the text was composed in. And uh, that's how I got my arm twisted into the studying Sanskrit and not just learning how to pronounce the Yoga Sutra properly, but to be able to understand it in the language that it was composed in and uh, follow the arguments and understand as directly as possible yoga philosophy and teach that as accurately as possible. Is that good enough or I left out some, yeah. some of the points? I mean, I was hoping you would mention your uh, wife and beautiful kid. <laughs> I'm, I'm married to Stephanie Howarth. We met in New York at a yoga teacher training. She's from Canada. And uh, we have a six-year-old, <laughs> um, Matthew, who's just an amazing teacher for me on so many levels. Uh, seeing him discover the world and uh, being his father gives me the opportunity not only to um, see the world again for the first time, but to expand my threshold of compassion and empathy. Uh, we also rescued a a dog. Uh, his name is Blue. He's a he's a golden doodle. He's about a, a year and a half old. So that's our family. Um, Could you tell me, tell us, um, how did you run into Geshe Michael, and what's what have you studied with Geshe Michael? Geshe Michael Roach came to a yoga studio I was teaching at back in two thousand and four. Was that the, the book tour? Tour. 
um, the Tibetan Heart Yoga Tour. Yeah. And uh, he gave a talk that uh, I found compelling. And a friend, Mira Shawnee, was getting ready to move out to Arizona. And I took her Tibetan Heart Yoga class, and it touched my heart. And uh, she asked if I could continue teaching that class. And I was clearly not qualified. So she arranged for me to travel out to Arizona to take the Tibetan Heart Yoga teacher training. Um, airfare and hotel expenses paid. I was like, how can I say no? <laughs> and uh, I was very grateful to, to be able to do that and continue to study um, pretty intensely. Not just the YSI courses, all the ones that were available um, at that time for about six years to about 2010, uh, but also the, the Asian Classics Institute courses and some of the advanced courses. For those that don't know, Mira started YSI. <laughs> She's like way back in the old old school days. I don't know, mid 2000s, 2006 or seven. So I. I found when I started studying this text at the same time, I was amazed how all of the ACI I had studied fit into one book and how much of it fit in one chapter of the book. And it, it really blew my mind, like 15 ACI courses crammed into one book and it gave me a different language and a different perspective on seeing the world that I resonated with. Like the idea of being a yogi, you know, like I didn't, I kind of liked that idea. I got rid of the image of that being a cartoon character or a cave dwelling hermit. And it had this powerful image for me of like, walking through the world as the highest version of me mm. and all of these teachings on how to how to do that it was really profound that such a short book could have so many profound for me life-changing ideas i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what place the yoga sutra holds in the world of of yoga philosophy that like why is it seen as such an important text well in context today we might know yoga as one of the the six main worldviews of indian philosophy uh, buddhism would be a, a seventh but in the the world of indian philosophy the yoga sutra is the root text for yoga philosophy it's the earliest known philosophical text where the, the argument for what yoga is and how to do it is clearly explained. Now, this has been somewhat of a challenge for people who have been introduced to modern yoga as stretching uh, with a little breathing every now and then. But the, the depth and the, the power of this method that has at least two millennia of momentum behind it can be applied to the, the modern yoga practice that we are familiar with and make it so much more powerful. So the text is really worth our time if we want to understand not only where yoga came from, but what it actually is. And you know, with the telephone game, one person tells another person, tells another person, several iterations down the line, it gets watered down, important things get lost, things that were never a part of it get added, and it can be very interesting, but it's always nice to trace it back to the source. And the Yoga Sutra contains that source in a language, Sanskrit, that was literally designed. Prior to it being Sanskrit, it was called Vedic. It's a wild language like any other. 
but Sanskrit is a perfected language that was created to keep the information that was being passed down from being corrupted as it was transferred from one generation to the next. And uh, there are a lot of schools of Indian philosophy that took to this language and used it in that way. So it's nice to be able to study the Yoga Sutra in the original language, and specifically with someone like Geshe Michael Roach, who has a great deal of expertise in the, the subject matter of the Yoga Sutra, plus with some of the other Indian schools of philosophy that yoga is a part of the conversation with. Yeah. Um, Going to interrupt us for a second. Translators, thumbs up or thumbs down? How are we doing? <laughs> Mixed reviews. Okay. Second thing, if you have a question, an easy question, you can type it in the chat for me. If you have a hard question, you can type it in the chat for Michael, and we will uh, look to address a few questions. Thank you for the suggestion for longer pauses between sentences. Um, now, Michael and I were talking uh, last night about you know, I think we all appreciate how Geshe Michael has the capacity to make complex things simple. You know, take a take a concept like emptiness and make it simple, relatable. The fourth chapter is challenging, and um, we were talking about. You know, why Geshe Michael might be in a even more, um, why he might be even more profoundly capable of teaching this chapter. Uh, because it, it dives into one of the schools of philosophy called the mind only school. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the subject matters of, of what are we looking for in this chapter. Um, one of the topics is going to be the capacity. It's a debate. Patanjali starts debating prevalent ideas of his time. And so he gets into this idea of, as Geshla talks about it, I like it, the mind is broken. The mind twists everything around. How can we use a broken instrument, the mind, to fix itself? If the tool that we're using is dysfunctional, where we're constantly imbued, embedded in ignorance, everything ex appears to be coming at me self-existent. How could we ever use the mind to fix itself? And it's a, it's a fascinating discussion. He also teaches um, how seeds are stored in the mind. And also a big discussion on if we have single pointed concentration on an object like pen, the mind is only imprinting pen, right? So tomorrow, how could I ever think I was looking at a pen? If there's single point of concentration just on pen, the seeds that are planted, it's just pen. How could there be memory? How could we ever think I saw a pen. And it's a big, long debate on, in uh, Tibetan, it's called Rang Rik. He translates it as apperception, which we looked up last night, and it's, it's, a, it's 
a good word, but it's not, it's hard to translate the idea perfectly in English. So I wanted to throw a couple ideas of what we'll study. Uh, and those are a couple of my favorite, but I wanted to uh, ask you, Michael, what in relation to the fourth chapter, what do you find particularly inspirational in it? Or what's your favorite, some of your favorite parts? What can we look forward to? What I'm looking forward to in this course is not only studying the fourth chapter yet again, it'll be like my 20th time, but with what I've learned um, about yoga philosophy and Buddhism, where there's so many parallels, so much common ground, and speaking to what you called a perception, this course will also include a review of the other chapters. So if you've never studied the Yoga Sutra before and you're like, what, starting with the fourth chapter? Don't worry, you'll be fine. It's an excellent way to start the course, to start the study of this text. But with the context of the previous three chapters, the ability to focus one pointedly on a single object, like the breath, or pen is what's known as dharana concentration. And if you can do this continuously, persistently, patiently, the flow state will emerge where you can lose the sense of yourself that causes anxiety or depression, just becomes absent, transparent, and enter into awareness of your awareness that can be similar to what's called metacognition. But as Earl and I were talking last night, it's not tied to thinking. So this awareness of our awareness, meta-awareness, can be silent. You can be aware of the story the words without taking it personally or being lost in it. And it's with that capacity, samadhi, that one can have a mind that is imperfect and tend to it like a gardener, pull weeds, plant seeds, and make a beautiful oasis for oneself and others. So one of the verses in the fourth chapter that I'm really excited about is the 15th verse and the conversation around that. The 15th verse, Vastu sam ye chitabe dayur vibhaktaha pantaha describes that minds with different paths can experience the same object differently. Two people can look at the same pen and based on their impressions, have a very different experience of that same object. Of course, a pen is a somewhat neutral object for most people, but this can apply to any object. And that's a, a great way to create space a perception around hot topics that can be triggering and cause us to shut down where as if we can practice yoga we can be able to observe the activities of the mind and bring them under control rather than being controlled by them so i'm excited to explore these hot topics and be able to self-soothe, use the, the techniques of the eight limbs of yoga, for example, so that I can sort out my mind on these important issues. Yeah, Somebody, uh, somebody's trying to get us in hot water in the chat, uh, asking, you know, 
is yoga this? Is the yoga sutras this? Or is the yoga sutras that? Um, you know, is it a is it a religious text? Is it a can you could you translate it from a a Christian perspective? Could you translate it from a Buddhist or a Hindu perspective? And there's a big discussion because the the text is often seen through the eyes of the most famous commentator, uh, a guy named Vyasa, Veda Vyasa. And so the text is so short. Um, it's sometimes it, it's hard to tell. Like one verse, my favorite example is it's lower, middle, or highest. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> and so all the commentators kind of scramble to what's he talking about? I, I don't know. And so they use Vyasa's commentary to explain Patanjali. And then there's a 2,000 year old lineage of looking at Patanjali through Vyasa. So I'm a little tentative to go down this road, but I know this is uh, something that you've thought about a lot. Can we take the Yoga Sutras away and look at it out of the lens of Vyasa? Can we get away from, from interpretation? Well, that's a sorry, to, sorry to do that to you. <laughs> no apologies required. Put on your seatbelts. <laughs> if we follow the arguments of the original thread of the Yoga Sutra, for example, those last three limbs, dharana, concentration, dhyana, flow, and samadhi, this ability to step outside of the prison of Asmita and observe whatever object we're observing without taking it personally, then this is what's called self-control, samyama. It's also called beginner's mind. It allows us to be teachable. And instead of pretending like we know everything, or that our opinion must be the right answer and get attached to that opinion. We can listen to other opinions without reacting to them, without having to believe them or agree with them, and use reason to consider the possibilities. So Vyasa's commentary is really good. So many gems and Vyasa's presentation of yoga philosophy. But I currently study yoga philosophy with a philosophy professor. His name is Dr. Shyam Ranganathan. And he is adamant about acknowledging that Vyasa's commentary has been relied upon for many centuries. But if you defer your thinking to someone else and just believe them, you will be at least one step removed from understanding yoga. The actual text, the actual philosophy is encouraging you to think for yourself. And that means <laughs> being able to practice self-control and to be teachable. Because if you're a full pot and you think you already know everything, then any information presented to you that you disagree with or don't already believe will just be noise. Whereas we're, if we're actually practicing yoga, a disagreement or information that you don't believe is actually a useful object to observe and to sort out. So Dr. Ranganathan, 
who translated the Yoga Sutra for Penguin Books in 2008, used a translation style that was attempting to correct for biases, uh, specifically colonialism, and to better understand the, the arguments made in the original thread of the Yoga Sutra that often line up with what Vyasa is saying and sometimes don't at all. And such disagreement is intolerable for, for anyone who practices interpretation, but actually um, a breath of fresh air and exciting for anyone who's thinking for themselves and approaching the text like a philosopher. So two views of the same object. If you would just hold up your, your left thumb for a second pretty closely and look at your left thumb, you maybe can see the cuticle and the ridges, but then close your right eye and look at your thumb. Then switch and close your left eye and look at your thumb and go back and forth a couple times. You see how your thumb moves? It's two images of the same object. And if you can allow them to integrate, you, they usually merge, but it produces a, an effect called parallaxing, where you can see the, the same object with more depth. Similarly, being able to not just tolerate two different views on the same object, but to create space for everyone to believe what they want to believe, to agree or disagree, we can have a much richer view of yoga philosophy. <clears throat> the disagreements between Vyasa and the original thread are something that Dr. Ranganathan has pointed out that um, have helped me understand that it's a great way to understand the text but not alone sufficient. He says, if you just defer to Fiasa, it's a lazy way of going about it. With and, all the love and compassion in his heart, of course. Yeah. And we're, we're in, uh, I think, agreement with that view in how Geshe-la approached this text also, because he also didn't approach the text through the lens of, of Vyasa. Um, and he translated it from the Sanskrit. And I think, you know, Geshe Michael claims to be a Jetsonkopian <laughs> at heart. You know, he's not a, a, a Christian or a Hindu or a Buddhist or a, you know, he's like, I, it's not religion. Uh, he doesn't think of the Yoga Sutras as a religious book. And his philosophy is the eyes of Chetsankapa. So that's an interesting, it's an interesting thing, the example. So now, and, and what you said really resonates about being able to learn the Sanskrit. Um, can you take it out of one perspective and talk about it without just putting it into another perspective? Now we're going to get a Jetson Kappa perspective. Could you be perspective free? That's an interesting uh, challenge, but I'm excited to revisit the text through Geshe Michael's Jetson Kappian paradigm. I, I find it very functional for me in my life. Um, and it well, back to that point about translating the, the Yoga Sutra free of perspective, though one can imagine that, that might just be a close-up of the horizon. The ability to acknowledge that you don't come to the text perspective free that your mind is automatically projecting onto it and owning that rather than being owned by it would be practicing yoga. 
not an easy thing to do, <laughs> but uh, worth uh, the good fight. Yeah. When I went into a three-year retreat, I asked Geshe Michael for some advice. You know, what, what should I focus on? And he said, focus on one thing. Don't dig a hundred holes one foot deep. He said, dig one hole a hundred feet deep. And uh, I said, okay. And then he suggested, study the Yoga Sutra, which is, it's short. And so I, that's what I did. I pretty much, this was the only text I brought in and shared Michael's attempts at memorizing it. Actually, Michael also took this text into three retreat and he also memorized it. And I was a little, I was a little pissed off because he says he memorized it in a year. <laughs> it took me two and a half years and uh, it's not easy. So um, it's well, been a very- That's yeah. two and a half years is still amazing. And uh, I've been working at it for 20 years, still haven't quite finished the task. So congratulations. Yeah. Um, we do have, we have eight more minutes. So if there's a question either from Michael or from the audience, please do. I saw one in the chat section. What's the relationship between yoga and seeds? Parentheses, Buddhism. In the Yoga Sutra, the seeds are called sanskaras, impressions. And the way the text describes yoga is the discipline of bringing the mental activities under control. So however they happen to be, afflicted or unafflicted, it's bringing them under control so that you can transform them to being unafflicted. And it's not like once they're unafflicted, I'm done, yay. <clears throat> Rather, it's no, it's like, oh, they're unafflicted, wonderful. Then this too will change. So it's more of a process of approximating that ideal of bringing the mental activities under control and enjoying the process without clinging to the outcome. And uh, I think there are many um, parallels between yoga and Buddhism. There are a lot of Buddhist references in the Yoga Sutra that Vyasa tends to ignore in his commentary quite skillfully in the first three chapters, cannot in the fourth. Uh, and the, the term seed is, the, uh, is used in the description of samadhi that uproots the mental affliction called asmita that makes us identify with the activities of our mind, preventing us from being able to take control of them. When we're identified with the activities of our mind, as the philosophy professor Shaun Ranganathan points out, any criticism of them will be taken as a personal attack. Any attempt to transform them will be seen as a, a personal kind of death that your nervous system will fight every step of the way. But if you can stop identifying with the activities of your mind, then you can start to take responsibility for them, shaping them in harmony with your values, what you genuinely care about. And uh, that is described as nirbija samadhi, seedless samadhi, which in the second chapter is just called samadhi. There's another question in the chat section. Do you want to handle this one, Earl? Uh, can you please tell today a little bit about uninterrupted attention from the Yoga Sutra perspective? I think there is something about that in the fourth chapter. Thank you. 
Oh, that's a huge question. I'm going to leave that one to uh, Keshe Michael. Um, but I will say, you know, I'm trying to think of what's the, why should people come to Geshe Michael's course? And it, it is for, you know, questions like that. Um, it's a brilliant chapter that's deeply philosophical. Uh, unlike some of the other chapters that are a little more, I found easier to understand, this chapter, Patanjali, he shows off that he is a brilliant um, philosopher. And, and he kind of takes a deep dive into some interesting debates. So if you're into that kind of thing, it's cool. But also, like Michael shared at the beginning, the fourth chapter is quite short. It's only 34 verses. And uh, then he'll do a, a review of the whole text. So it'll be a very beautiful overview of the whole text. And, um, and you get a sense of the flow. Each chapter we could study on its own, but we can also really tap into the flow and the thread at the sutra that ties the whole thing together. And so for those reasons, I think it's a great uh, course. And then, you know, if you're not so into deep philosophy or the whole book, there's a, there's a chap, there's a verse on drugs. So if that's your, uh, if that's your thing and you want to find out what Patanjali says, <laughs> he's got that and that's the first class and then you could you could figure uh can we attain spiritual insights by going on ayahuasca trips hmm. and he's got a very clear answer to that so if that's interesting this course is also for you but then my favorite part is um <laughs> He talks about in the third verse, he says, we must become as gardeners. Mm. And, uh, and it's such a, it's the, when Geshe Michael teaches, I think there's 37 verses that he says, this is the most important verse. <laughs> <laughs> but this verse in chapter four, the third verse, we must become as gardeners, is the most important verse. It's the most important verse in the in the text. And it really says, understanding all the philosophy, the mind-only school, the this school, the wrong rick, all of that's great. But if it doesn't lead you to the answer of love, then you you didn't understand the book. If it, if it doesn't lead us to the place of the necessity of taking care of, of our fellow humans or beings on this existence, if, it, if we're not taking care of each other, we didn't understand the book. And um, through the cultivation of of the of the immeasurables through the cultivation of love of compassion then uh, then we're really living the life of a yogi and so i love the it's got a little bit of everything it's got the deep philosophy it's got the review there's a verse on drugs <laughs> it's, it's really about if we don't walk away with the answer of, of love and compassion, then we missed it. And it's such a beautiful place to come back to. And, and, and really that's um, what I've appreciated about my recent conversations with Michael is that that's something that he 
has embodied so beautifully in his life. It's inspiring. That's what we should be using the text for and then being able to walk the walk of Patanjali and, and look at that, the world through, through the eyes of that love and compassion. And so if, if that sounds interesting, then um, I think it's a really beautiful course. And obviously, you know, Geshe Michael is, uh, you know, it's hard to find a scholar and a teacher and a human like Geshe Michael. I don't need to sell him, but um, just feel so excited or honored to be able to hear this teaching from him. And like he said, it might be the last time he teaches. So let's put up the QR code um, so that people can know where to sign up. And please, you know, share the information. Um, if you know somebody that might be interested, please pass on the opportunity. And if, uh, if money is an issue, um, in, there's scholarships available through the YSI website. And uh, don't, don't let something like that deter us from the opportunity. So I'm hoping someone can share that QR code. We'll give it a second. Bob is reminding us we can find it in there's it's going to be in Russian, Vietnamese, Spanish, Romanian, Chinese, English. Those are our distributors and we really appreciate all of those people that are helping us put on the event. Wow, thank you for linking the scholarships. Um, I'm not seeing a QR code. You might have to go to the website. Could somebody put our website on? Oh, here we go. Just in a nick of time. Awesome. Michael, I appreciate your time this morning. It was a pleasure. Thank you for the invite. And uh, looking forward to your teaching as part of the event. The event will have, will have uh, YSI teachers will teach uh, meditation in the morning, morning Arizona time, followed by Geshe Michael's teachings, and then a yoga class. And then we'll take a break. I'll teach a review of um, what Geshe Michael has taught. And then Michael will teach the, some Sanskrit related to the verses. So it's a very full program. There's a lot, there's a lot there. And, uh, there are no prerequisites to learn Sanskrit. Come as you are. Yeah. I will take you where you are and help you move a little bit further. Yeah, cool. So thanks, a uh, big thank you to all of our translators and our apologies to translators. And um, thank you to ASI, ACI for uh, Worldview Productions for producing and to uh, the YSI and again to Michael, appreciate it. And look forward to seeing you at the course. Thank you, Beryl.